my pleasure and privilege to introduce Dr. Azad Madni. Um, I'll attempt to do him justice. Uh, Dr. Madni is a professor of astronautical engineering and executive director of USC Systems Architecting and Engineering Program. He's also the director of the Distributed Autonomy and Intelligence Systems Laboratory. He's currently the co-founding chair of IEEE's SMC's award-winning technical committee for model-based systems engineering, which he co-founded in 2013. He's also the founder and CEO of Intelligent System Technology, Inc., a high-tech company he founded in 1994 to pursue research and development in intelligent systems technology for aerospace and defense. Dr. Madney is a fellow of six professional societies, including IEEE, INCOSI, AIAA, and AAS. He's also the recipient of INCOSI's Pioneer Award and this year's Founders Award. In 2019, he received three additional prestigious awards, the AIAA and ASEE John Leland Atwood Award for Excellence in Engineering Education and Research, the ASME CIE Leadership Award, and the President's Award from the Society for Modeling and Simulation International. He's the author of Transdisciplinary Systems Engineering, Exploiting Convergence in a Hyperconnected World, and the co-editor-in-chief of Disciplinary Convergence in Systems Engineering Research. He's also the co-author of Trade-Off Decisions in Systems Design. He conducts research in artificial safety and self-driving vehicles, as well as distributed swarms. Uh, Dr. Madney is the principal investigator of two ongoing CERC research tasks, Next Generation Adaptive Cyberphysical Human Systems and Formal Methods in Resilient Systems Design using a flexible contract approach. Uh, the links to those projects can be found on the CERC website. Uh, and without further ado, I apologize for the hold up. Uh, Dr. Madney. Mimi, thank you for that introduction. And uh, can everyone hear me? I hope so. Okay. Uh, I want to welcome everyone to the CERC talk. I see a lot of familiar names and several new names here. Welcome to every one of you. Uh, I'm going to talk today about the research we are conducting at USC under CERC sponsorship. The general area of research is distributed autonomy, and the specific focus is on adaptive cyber-physical human systems. The interesting thing about this topic is that it's one of the key research areas identified by the CERC Research Council. It cuts across the four CERC research thematic areas of enterprise and system of systems, trusted systems, human capital development, and systems engineering and systems engineering management transformation. The outline of my talk, uh, I'm going to begin by providing the context of 21st century DOD systems. I'll talk a little bit about distributed autonomy research in terms of the specific trust that we have ongoing. Then I will talk a little bit about our multi-model based approach that we have developed under CERC and other sponsorship. I'll then share with you an illustrative example that shows how these various methods can be brought to bear on a problem of significance to the Department of Defense. Then I'll show you a prototype system that we have built under CERC sponsorship and uh, walk you through some screens to give you a flavor for the capabilities of the system and what you might be able to do with it going forward. I will then summarize the findings to date that we have had on both efforts and then I will have a few takeaways for you to take back with you and hopefully they, they should be of some use. So let's talk about you know, 21st century DOD systems. And this is where I'd like to set the stage for our research. Um, they are high complexity systems, and we know that they are hyperconnected, and we have increasingly greater interdependencies. They need to operate safely for long periods of time in dynamic and certain environments subject to disruptions. And the disruption might include hostile actors and even deceptive actors. These systems tend to be long-lived, usually more than 20 years. Some of them have been around for almost 60 years. It is highly likely that they will be extended and adapted over their lifetime. They have stringent physical and cybersecurity requirements. And of course, they have to be adaptive and they exhibit distributed autonomy, the focus of this talk. The bottom line is that Against the backdrop of these requirements, we need new modeling methods and tools because what we have today 
is not adequate. So I feel obliged to define the term distributed autonomy because this is a series. So I went looking for a definition and uh, I decided to write my own. I hope you find this uh, informative and, and useful. I choose to define distributed autonomy as the extent to which a team of agents can sense its environment, plan collaboratively based on a priori and sense knowledge about the environment, and act in concert upon that environment to accomplish task-specific goals assigned by an external agent, which could be a human, or created by the agent team without any external intervention. So with that backdrop, you will see we'll bring this definition to life in the illustrative example and the prototype that we have created. So to take you now to a very quick overview of the two ongoing research efforts that I have ongoing with CERC uh, that fall under the general rubric of distributed autonomy as well as AI and autonomy. The common thread among these research efforts are engineered resilience and adaptive system behavior. As Mimi said, the first one is formal and probabilistic modeling and resilient system design. And very quickly, the reason we want formal is because we are looking for provable correctness. Provable correctness is key to safety of these systems. We're also looking for probabilistic because we need to be able to adapt to uncertain environments. And the challenges we face in modeling are that we have to contend with partial observability, unexpected and unknown disruptions, and noisy sensors. The second project, the second re research project under CERC is Adaptive Cyber-Physical Human Systems. It actually, the full title is Next Generation Adaptive Cyber-Physical Human System, but I thought that was way too many adjectives. We say adaptive for two reasons the ability to respond to contingencies and disruptions, and as importantly, if not more, the ability to learn from evidence and adapt accordingly. The challenges we face in this context are an incomplete initial system model, human variability, where to insert the human in the control loop, and, that, and for the same reason, where to insert the human model in the control loop, how to keep track of dynamic context and manage that, and then how to contend with changing autonomy so that the human and the cyber-physical elements stay continue coupled as you go through changes in autonomous allocation. I always like to describe engineered resilience as a messy problem. I mean, you will find there are so many definitions in the literature. Many of them are domain-specific. The ones that appear attractive at first blush have not resulted in productive lines of inquiry. I usually like to describe resilience along four dimensions. The capacity to rebound, the capacity to resist, the capacity to adapt, and the capacity to continually adapt. But coming back to engineered resilience, why is it a messy problem? Well, first and foremost, requirements can be imprecise, especially initially. Actions can be unclear, especially initially. The environment can be unknown or partially known. The system states can be ambiguous. These characteristics are incompatible with the traditional modeling methods that we have today. So we have to do something different. Now, going on to the application domain, which is cyber-physical human system, once again, I tried to find a good definition, and in the absence of finding something that suited the needs of CERC and what I was trying to accomplish on CERC research, I chose to define my own, and uh, I will share that with you now. Cyber-physical human systems are a class of safety-critical, socio-technical systems in which the interactions between the physical system and cyber elements that control its operation are influenced by human agents. The system objectives are achieved through interactions between the physical system or process to be controlled, the cyber elements, which is the communication links and software, 
and the human agents who monitor and influence cyber physical system operation. The distinguishing feature of cyber physical human system in terms of contrasting it with a traditional human machine system is that human acting as agents can intervene to redirect cyber physical elements or supply needed information and not just uh, perform in the role of exercising manual override or assuming full control. So you have a much more granular level of intervention and interaction between the human and the cyber physical counterparts. You know, this is a pretty semantically overloaded term, cyber physical human systems. It was uh, the original term cyber physical systems was, was uh, created by Helen Gill at the National Science Foundation. And cyber physical human systems are an elaboration of the, that same concept. They're all safety critical systems, but they can range from something very tiny, like medical devices, to a large scale system of systems. Everything from self-driving vehicles, smart buildings, smart manufacturing, medical devices, and unmanned aerial vehicles are all subsumed within the rubric of cyber physical human systems. So now that we've got that definition down, let's talk a bit about adaptive cyber physical human systems. First and foremost, they respond to disruptions and changes in context. And these are two areas of interest in CERC research by most of the researchers today. And when I say respond to disruption and changes in context, I mean things like as simple as adjusting execution workflow to adapting the plan to reallocating tasks and resources. They all come under the rubric of responding to disruptions and changes in context. The next is to leverage unique human capabilities. And in this case, very briefly, we're talking about human creativity and ingenuity on the one hand, and humans' context awareness that comes very naturally to humans, but they take quite a bit of effort to get that into machines. We also need to be able to exploit human versatility. And by that I mean humans could be acting in a variety of roles. They could be part of a social network, in which case they serve as passive sensors. They could be supervisors in the overall process, in which case you would say that they are on the loop. And of course, they could be active performance, performers working with software agents, in which case you would say that they are in the loop. We also need to be able to make sure that we circumvent human limitations. And human limitations, not just in terms of cognitive, attentional, and observational limits, but also in terms of the capacity to adapt. Humans do adapt, but oftentimes slowly and sometimes not very well, and that has to be taken into account. So just to make a statement that humans are adaptive really does not address the issues of the variability and the adaptability of humans as a function of context. The next thing we need to look at is to be able to exploit the cyber physical system capabilities. And here we are talking about the processing speed that you get in computational devices and such, the reconfigurability and the memory, that, uh, uh, the cap memory capacity that they bring to the overall uh, problem. And then finally, they learn from experience. And when I say learn from experience, I mean everything from observations and appraisal of outcomes using machine learning. And there are a variety of machine learning techniques, and we will go into that very briefly in the next several charts. So, what can be distributed and adaptive cyber physical human systems? It's a pretty semantically overloaded term, so it's worth kind of unraveling that a bit. First and foremost, sensing, which is distributed among fixed sensors, humans, and mobile robots. And in this context, humans are the ones that bring to the, the problem domain their ability to rapidly contextualize and localize uh, problem situations. The agents, in, on the other hand, are extremely good at detection and identification. So what you have is this whole notion of what's called shared perception. 
that capitalizes on the strengths of each while circumventing the limitations of both. The next thing is planning. And when we talk about planning, we're talking about this, the planning is distributed between humans and cognitive agents. In this case, the humans would perform in the role of a supervisor or a monitor, as well as, in some cases, as a joint task performer. The agents would be doing the low-level planning tasks based on pre-planned protocols and engaging in explicit coordination as and when the need arises. The next thing that can be distributed is decision-making, which is a shared activity between humans and cognitive agents. In this case, the humans can set objectives and be the creator of novel options to address what you might call a broken play using a sports metaphor. The agents, on the other hand, with infallible memory, can help in the evaluation of those options and selecting the option as well as issuing alerts to warn the human about things that look out of whack, so to speak. And then the last item is control, which can be distributed between human and actuation agents. In this case, the humans would be the ones responsible for high-level commands, and especially with cyber-physical human system, by able, being able to intervene at different levels in the control loop. A very difficult problem and a rich area of research. Agents, on the other hand, would do the low-level control and would, would issue execution alerts to notify the human of some things that are not going according to plan. And then finally, we have learning, which is distributed between machine and learning agents. Among the different learning agents that are distributed in various computational devices uh, within the cyber-physical system. So here's a, a quick system concept of an adaptive cyber-physical system. To the left, you have the electrophysiological sensors that measure a variety of biological functions, for example, eye movement, brain function, heart rate, muscle motion, perspiration, and such. And they basically replace the conventional human-computer interaction devices, such as keyboards and mouses and joysticks and, and touch screens. Mediating information between the human and the controller is a network fabric, which supports communication between the electrophysiological sensors, as well as other sensors, with the controller and the hardware. It applies sensor control readings to the controller electronics and software. The controller that you see to the right aggregates the sensor information and sends commands to the actuators, which are part of the physical system. Both the sensors and actuators are part of the physical systems that then react and act on the environment, which in turn then responds and this closed loop process goes on. Now I want to talk a little bit about the deficiencies in existing methods and tools and why we have to do this kind of research under the auspices of CERC. If you look at the deficiencies in methods, you find something very interesting. Most methods that we have today are not well suited for modeling tightly coupled socio-technical learning systems. Every one of those adjectives has a profound meaning, tightly coupled, being addressed in the computer science and electrical engineering community, socio-technical aspects are being addressed by us, and the learning system being addressed by a wide variety of people in engineering, uh, computer science, system engineering community. Now, why are they ill-suited? Well, first and foremost, they lack the semantics of time, which are very important when you have tight, tight coupling. They also lack the ability to improve with use. They lack the semantics necessary to represent human behavior. And as importantly, they lack the flexibility to represent human behavior with variable fidelity. You do not need to represent every aspect of the human in every single task because many of the capabilities of human are not brought to uh, bear on a particular aspect of a task. So you only need those things that are needed in the task at hand. And finally, they lack the ability to learn whether it be offline or in situ during operation. Now, the tools which reflect these methodologies suffer from the same deficiencies. And what those are, and the way they manifest themselves, is they address cyber, physical, and human elements in isolation. They focus primarily on subsystems, not their interactions, dependencies, and their synchronization constraints. By and large, their build-time approaches 
with no provision for runtime learning and improvement of the model. And their representation of the human, if any, tends to be quite impoverished and, and inadequate for really assessing the joint performance of human cyber-physical systems. So then we get into systems modeling. There are many different approaches, and the choice depends really on the characteristics of both the system and the environment. The same system operating a different environment would require a different model. So the environment really shapes the choice of the modeling as much as the complexity of the system itself. There are different aspects of system behavior that need to be represented, and if and when you do, you need to harmonize them in the sense that they are based on a common set of assumptions, they do not contradict each other, and none of these things are trivial. The most serious problem that you run into is that there is going to be a gap between requirements of the models that need to reflect those requirements. And this contributes to the poor flow down of requirements from the system level to the software level, and a major problem that we have today. In fact, in 2007, the USC Center of Software Engineering changed its name to Center for Software and Systems Engineering in recognition of this problem. So let's look at system modeling requirements. Take it one at a time and see what we learn from that. First and foremost, you need verifiability. You need verifiability of the model because it's in the sense of it, you can provably, you can establish provable correctness of the model. And why do you need that? You need that for safety. And safety is critical, and all mission critical and safety critical systems. So this is an important requirement for all such systems going into the 21st century. But you also need flexibility, which acts in tension with verifiability. You need to be able to adapt to changing conditions. You also need to be able to reason bidirectionally, because you need that to be able to create a resilient response in a systematic way and not some ad hoc you know, thing that attends to the immediate problem and makes you pay for it later. You also need scalability and extensibility of the models. And in our case, in terms of the number of agents, the number of interconnections, the system should scale linearly and not exponentially. The model should be such that it provides utility even with partial information, which means it's not data hungry. There are many models uh, that can provide a lot of information if you provide all the inputs that are needed. But the real world, unfortunately, does not like to conform with that requirement. And so you have to have a system that says, give me the best information you have, I'll give you the best answers I can at the moment, and we will improve upon that answers jointly as you give me better information and I'll give you better answers. And finally, the system needs to be able to learn from new observations, which is called evidence-based learning. You see this in the medical industry, you see this in the manufacturing industry. This is one of the most important aspects of modeling that we have, uh, that we have to attend to here. And this is the aspect of modeling that makes modeling go from an open loop process into a closed loop process, where the evidence is used to continually refine the model so you can get better and more precise results from the model. Now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the multi-model based approach that we have developed uh, in our research for CERC. So we use multiple modeling constructs, and each has a reason for existence, as you will see that they attend to the requirements that we have identified earlier. So we have formal modeling, and formal modeling is key for you know, correctness verification. We have probabilistic modeling to attend to uncertainties, both in the system's knowledge of system states and the environment. We have optimization uh, in the form of uh, optimizing fitness functions and such when we have that, the level of information that we need to perform op optimization. And then we have machine learning to continue to learn to improve our model estimates. Where do models come in? They come in in four different places. First and foremost, in planning and decision making, which is the highest level in a cyber physical human system. But they also come in at the next level, which is the control of both simulated and physical systems. As importantly, if not more, they also come into play in human behavior modeling, and this is where the notion of selective fidelity comes in. How much of the human do I need to model to be able to get reasonably correct answers? And finally, they come in when it comes to learning of the system and environmental states that you start off with partial knowledge 
And as you go deeper into the mission, you incrementally learn through observations and you're able to improve on those estimates. And in each case, the models have to be visualized to be able to have good coupling between the human and the cyber physical system. And so what for that, we have a context aware dashboard with visual and sensory queuing. At this point, the queuing is mostly visual, but it could be multiple sensory uh, dimensions and modalities. And of course, it has to be multi-perspective and multi-level. And you'll see examples of that when we get into the example. So the, in response to these needs, we came up with an interesting modeling construct that we call a resilience contract. And this diagram is our attempt to show what a resilience contract might look like. So as shown in this figure, it has deterministic and stochastic parts. The deterministic parts are shown in yellow and with a backdrop of light blue. The stochastic parts are shown in dark blue against the backdrop of you know, pale green or whatever the color looks like uh, on your screen. The agents take inputs and generate observations. Agents generate observable outputs while operating with partially observable states. The inputs to and the outputs from this resilience contract defines the policy execution space that you see to the right. The resilience contract agent evaluates the POMDP, the partially observable Markov decision process representation for reward. The typical responses that come out of the POMDP evaluation are things like keep going the way you are, stop because you're not going in the proper direction, enforce a particular trajectory to a safe state immediately, or failing everything, notify a support team or the commander uh, that you are unable to essentially uh, deal with the situation at hand. Now I'm going to take you to the illustrative example. And this art rendering, which is somewhat of a better diagram than I had in the last Earth presentation, shows a C-130 transport aircraft that has landed on an airstrip. We need to maintain close surveillance of the aircraft perimeter to detect and thwart intruders. The collection assets that we have are building-mounted video cameras that you see in the adjacent buildings, LWIRs, and unattended ground sensors. You also have these quadcopters, uh, the, or drones as you might want to call them, with downward facing cameras. The goal in this scenario is to maximize and maintain sensor coverage of the aircraft perimeter despite disruptions. And disruptions can take a variety of forms. You could lose a particular quadcopter. You could lose, have a, a loss of a sensor on one of them, uh, buildings or, or in, uh, on the quadcopter. You could have a malfunctioning video camera and examples of such uh, disruptions. So the exemplar action that you would take in response to that could be simple action or they could be compound action. That could be a combination of actions. For example, reposition a flying quadcopter, launch a reserve quadcopter, request additional resources, uh, and such. And the way you depict the states in this particular situation is you say everything is green to indicate that you have full perimeter coverage. It's yellow when you're responding to a disruption. It's red when you lack the capability to, rest to restore perimeter coverage, and that's when you're in the red state. And then in that situation, the cyber physical system sends out an alert to the commander and says, beyond me, you gotta take over from here. The prototype scope that we have, that we have implemented, has multiple quadcopters with downward facing video cameras. We have building mounted video cameras and LWIRs, the quadcopters hold position and altitude that maximize the collective fitness function. The fitness function in this case, which is a type of evaluation or objective function, reflects the perimeter coverage. The higher the fitness function, the better the coverage. The lower the value, the less the coverage. The quadcopters can change their position and altitude to maximize the fitness function. Some of the contingencies that you can run into are low battery that causes the quadcopter to land or it could be a loss of a quadcopter entirely. Some of the resilient responses that you would make in this is you may reposition the remaining quadcopters to restore the perimeter coverage, failing which you would launch a backup quadcopter if the repositioning does not work. And of course, beyond that, you would request additional resources from the commander 
or, or whoever is in the chain of command because you are unable to provide the requisite coverage uh, to protect uh, the, the safety of that aircraft. Now here I'm going to show you how this quadcopter, let's take a look at a single quadcopter that is trying to, that's going to be launched from a particular site. It's going to make its way to a target area and at that point it will participate in maintaining perimeter coverage of the cargo air airplane. So what you have here is a quadcopter position that is so shown relative to a reconnaissance target that's the red star and also with respect to the field of view which is shown in blue. And so the whole the important thing is that the, quad, 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 the quadcopter is trying to make its way to the red star and what is allow, what's guiding it to that position because in this case it has partial observability is the Palm DP model, the partially observable markup decision process that guides it into that vicinity of that red star. Here are some exemplar contracts that you can see uh, that come into play in that movement. So use. The first one is, for example, it says if not over the target and you're healthy and your battery is green, then you move to target. And, and there's a whole variety of such contracts, nine presented over here that you can read at your leisure, that allow you to make your way to the red star. We have very simplified uh, Palm DP models here. The partially observable markup decision process models are used in two different ways. One is to monitor and maintain the health of the system, which is important, and the other is to maintain the mission progress of the UAV, the quadcopter. These two models mutually support and cooperate with each other. You can look at the details, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to brief the, the, every single bubble. Suffice to say that these two models are the basis for the intelligent navigation of the quadcopter from where it is at the launch point to making it to a target point which is indicated by the red star in the previous view graph. So now we come to the whole notion of the fitness function. And uh, the fitness function, most of you know, uh, is an evaluation function that, uh, that uh, is used along with several other, uh, various other uh, evaluation functions to determine the, uh, uh, how well you're doing in terms of your optimization. So for example, uh, uh, if you look up the, uh, the Wikipedia definition, it will tell you that it's a type of objective function that is used to summarize the single figure of merit, how close a given solution is to achieving its objective. And the motivation and the inspiration for fitness, fitness function comes from genetic algorithms where it was first used, and it's often now used to guide simulations towards an optimal solution. Fitness functions tend to be rather domain-specific. They exploit domain knowledge to simplify the, the function that you're trying to optimize. In our case, and in this particular scenario context, we discretize the perimeter into tiles in this very simple thing. Our goal is that one or two cameras are observing each tile, and more than two is redundant and should not be rewarded in terms of the Palm DP reward function. The closer the coverage, the higher the resolution of the imaging, the better it is. The simple approach that we use at the present that we intend to refine in future research is quite simple. It says for each tile and each camera, if the tile is visible from the camera, then you sum up one over the distance to the camera, and then you cap each tile sum to avoid rewarding redundant coverage. The future improvements that we contemplate to the fitness function are that we want to reward the views from widely separate camera locations to maximize the available information. For example, we could bring story a stereo into the picture. We also want to be able to account for different camera capabilities. For example, higher resolution cameras on fixed building cameras you know, would get higher weighting. Now the next thing I would like to talk to you about is the multi-level coverage algorithm. So we have multi-agent control. There are multiple quadcopters that move independently to maximize their contribution to the fitness function. The resulting cooperative motion between these quadcopters works to increase their the overall fitness, which means a better uh, job of perimeter coverage. Second important aspect is the adaptation to changing circumstances. For example, 
If one quadcopter crashes or runs low on battery, then the others move in to adapt to the changed coverage. And then finally, you have, of course, the human in the loop aspect of the thing, which is if multiple agents control autonomously done is insufficient to provide adequate coverage, then human intervention is requested. And at this point, the human can act and act to launch an additional quadcopter or may decide to essentially hand out the problem to somebody at higher headquarters. But anyway, these are the different variations in the multi-level coverage algorithm. Now I'm going to talk to you very quickly about the, the dashboard that we have for this system. Uh, this is all working and implemented and demonstrated both at CERC as well as in the Pentagon. So the purpose of this dashboard is first, first and foremost, it's a customizable dashboard. So its purpose is to monitor and control multiple assets that could include simulated and physical vehicles. Could be UAVs, could be ground vehicles, whatever. The underlying technologies are quite well known. We have a drone quit platform with visualization facilities. We have the quadcopter hardware and also the quadcopter simulation models. When you have the quadcopter planning and decision-making model, and then we have the quadcopter controller. The key capabilities that we have so far is that the simulated vehicles exhibit the behavior of the physical vehicle. That means at some point in the future, once we are able to feed the data back from the physical vehicle to the simulated vehicle, the simulated vehicle can become an instance and essentially become a digital twin of the physical vehicle. The same commands that are used to control the, the vehicle models are used to control the physical vehicles, and we have demonstrated that. In other words, we can switch from the simulated to the physical vehicle and vice versa. Here are some screens that sets you, gives you the context. So here you have is the dashboard. You can see the this dashboard is specifically designed for a perimeter coverage problem. To the left, you have the mission view. To the right, you have a selected camera view. Right below the mission view, you have a mission log that tells you what's gone on. And below that, you have the state of the battery and the health of the system. And here you see all the batteries are doing well. And to the middle and bottom, you see the controls for the quadcopter one, two, and three, and such. And then to the right, you have the views for each of the quadcopters. We have three quadcopters, but they're all on the, on the ground. Therefore, those, those screens are blank. So this is basically the simulation dashboard. Now. Importantly, there are two buildings that are shown, each with a video camera that you see in the left hand in the mission view. There are two buildings, one at the top, one at the bottom. Each has a video camera attached to it, and the coverage areas of the cameras are shown as the shadows in the plan view. You see those shadows. The top right view is from the selected camera, which is building at the bottom. And the important thing to know is the, the shadow and the shading determines how well that your coverage is at that point. Now here you see the dashboard showing the coverage area. The rectangular area that you see surrounding the aircraft or around the aircraft is really an intensity map. The lighter colors means that you have better coverage. The darker colors means that you have poor coverage. Once again, in this case, none of the quadcopters have been launched, so the perimeter coverage is solely due to the building cameras, one at the top, one at the bottom. Once again, the dark areas show poor coverage either because they're outside the field of view of, the, of either camera or because they're too far from any camera. If you look in the middle, at the bottom, you see for the first time the coverage, which is, there's a fitness function, and the fitness value is 18.74 in this example. Now we move on to the dashboard with one quadcopter during optimization of this fitness function. Note in this particular case that the automatic fitness function optimization right in the middle at the bottom is indicated, has been checked. You see that with that red uh, square dot. So that the quadcopter is now moving in a manner to maximize the fitness function. The coverage area here shows the coverage due to the quadcopter. That's what you see. And the mess messages that you see in the mission log on the left-hand side, right below the mission view, tells you the various movements that the quadcopter is may making in search of the optimal location to position itself in space. Now you see the, the, the dashboard showing the optimal location of a single quadcopter. That means the quadcopter now has arrived at its optimal location. And you, know, you see here the fitness function now is 25.25, which is higher than it was before because it has reached that. 
And the way the quadcopter reached that fitness function, it climbed about 60 meters and yawed about 20 degrees to the left to fit its field of view with the aircraft perimeter. And of course, in, if you look to the right, you're seeing this for the selected camera view for the first time in the right-hand display. And if you look below that, you see the quadcopter, one, has a view there. The other two are still blank because they have not yet been launched. Now you see the dashboard showing optimal location for three quadcopters. Three quadcopters in flight, and you can see that because all three of them have their views now with the quadcopter showing each of the case with respect to the, uh, the perimeter coverage of the aircraft. These quadcopters now have deliberately separated to increase the quality of the co coverage of the entire perimeter. And note that the selected quadcopter, in this case, which is shown on the right-hand top view, has rotate its field of view to concentrate on the east end of the perimeter to maximize the coverage. And of course, the result is you get better reward in terms of the fitness function, because if you look in the center bottom, you see that the fitness function now is 49.88, which means that you have better coverage than you had before with a single quadcopter, and you have uh, much uh, better coverage because the three of them have optimally located under the control of an automated uh, fitness function optimization scheme. Now you see a situation where the dashboard shows you three flying quadcopters with one low on battery and ready to land. So here the quadcopters are under manual control. And how do you know that? You can see that the red box that was checked, automatic function optimization is no longer checked. So now you're looking at the human-machine interaction. The human has been alerted of a low battery condition along with the recommendation to launch a backup quadcopter in the mission log. These Feedback items are indicated in red, which means that the human needs to attend to that very quickly. If you look at the battery conditions, you see that one of the quadcopters, the battery is very low, which is why it has to land. The operator in this case now is not obliged to accept this recommendation. It's important to realize. The operator may accept this recommendation or may choose to ignore that and do a handoff to somebody else. So the operator ultimately has total control over what finally gets done in terms of decision making. Here you see the fitness has dropped now to 34.21 in the center in the middle bottom because now you have lost a quadcopter and you lost the coverage provided by that quadcopter. So this kind of gives you a good flavor of how the system is and this is all working and implemented and we intend to show this at the SRR in November at CERC. The next important aspect here that we have to address and it's a very important area and not very well understood is human behavior modeling. This is an important aspect to gauge the performance of the cyber-physical human system in both nominal and contingency operations. And of course, they need to be supported by appropriate use cases, and you need to demonstrate that you can handle those use cases well. And in fact, that the use cases do in fact span the performance space. We need to be able to show that the effects of cognitive load, fatigue, and attention levels on error rates are acceptable. That means you have manageable load, the, the, the human is not terribly fatigued, and the human has a sufficiently reasonable attention span to be able to attend to the problem at hand. Some of the key research questions that arise here, and every one of them is a difficult question and worthy of the research unto itself. The first is, what aspects of the human should be represented in specific problem contexts, knowing that not every aspect of the human participates in problem solving and decision making in the cyber-physical human system uh, performance. The second is, and this is a very tough question, is there a methodological basis to determine an appropriate sparse representation of a human? Because if you can, you can reduce the computation load and you can get by with the simplest possible model that allows you to have the answers and, and behave uh, in a good enough way uh, in terms of maintaining uh, good performance with the cyber-physical counterpart. The next level, which is even more difficult, at what level should the human, and by definition it's the human model, be incorporated in the cyber-physical human system feedback loop, which means should the human or the human model be on the loop, which is in a supervisory mode, in the loop, which means as an agent in the system, be inside the controller, which means in a very tight control loop, or in fact be inside the system model in a model reference sense. 
So these are very difficult questions that need to be answered if we are going to make a dent in this very difficult problem. And of course, the final question is what combination of models do you need? Do you need a math model in combination with a parametric model? Do you also need a probabilistic model? Do you, when do you need an optimal control model? So what subset or what combination of these do you need in a particular problem context for a specific cyber physical human system? And these are the research questions uh, that have to be attended. The next item is machine learning. And machine learning is a very, very important aspect of this uh, problem. First, you need to be able to determine the unidentified system states during system operation and use because we start off with partial knowledge. Next, you need to determine the unidentified environment states during mission execution as you gain information from the sensors um, uh, over a, a timeline. And the next, you need to be able to capture human priorities and preferences in different contexts in the simulated operational environment so you know what the human views is the most important task and what the human views is less important task so that the machine is in sync with that and it does not have a different set of priorities. And then the next thing is, of course, where are the opportunities and where are the complicating factors here? So there are many opportunities to learn in this particular problem domain. You have sensors that provide information. You have networks that provide information. And of course, you have people, human intelligence in the loops. And these are all sources of learning. The complicating factors are you don't have complete observability. Sensors are pretty noisy. There could be disruptive events that could happen anywhere. And making the problem even worse is that you could have hostile and sometimes even deceptive actors trying to throw you off. So when you do machine learning, you're doing that in the face of these difficulties. And again, this is a non-trivial problem. So some of the machine learning methods that you can bring to bear. Supervised learning. And here you're looking at this requires labeled data. You create a data model with offline training. And the application for this kind of a approach is you learn the human's information-seeking policies in the different contexts. And you use that then to provide inf information to the human. The next is unsupervised learning. And here you create data clusters. You learn patterns and behaviors. And you continue to learn, train, and refine the model online during execution. This kind of an approach is very useful when you're trying to learn the intrusion patterns in the aircraft perimeter security of the problem that I just presented to you. And finally, you have reinforcement learning. This requires real-time interaction with the environment. And it may, you make decisions. That means you take actions based on the existing patterns and knowledge of states and the real-time environment feedback, which you get in terms of observations. The application of this is to progressively learn the system and environmental state to a sufficient degree based on the incoming census reports in a partially observable environment, and in so doing, continue to improve your decision making. The prototype testbed that we have, you know, we have uh, quadcopters of different sizes and different scales, and we have both uh, in the center, you see the uh, it's an instrumented testbed that we have. So basically, the quadcopters are driven by what's called a Raspberry Pi or a Navio flight controller. You have a full inertial measurement unit, three-axis accelerometer, rate gyros, and a magnetometer. You have inputs from laptop and our remote controller. And that gives you like control values, things like throttle and roll, pitch, and yaw. And you perform with this autonomous flight. This is all part of an instrumented testbed, which we have a layered architecture. There's the UI part, there's the planning and decision-making, there's the control part, and then there are the data sources. We have customized Python scripts for vehicle control, uh, and we have drone kit framework and commands that support that. We are able to do semi-autonomous flights in terms of launch, takeoff, hover, and perform limited waypoint navigation. And then, of course, we have context-sensitive monitoring and control dashboard, where we monitor the control, the vehicle status, <clears throat> and we communicate with simula simulated vehicles as well as with physical vehicles. So we have this kind of capability right now in our test bed. The implementation is a distributed simulation architecture. And so what you have is a world model, you know, and that's interacting with the soldiers, in this case, a couple of soldiers. And you have a world server computer that interacts with the network. <clears throat> and the network is, interacts with the, a mission dashboard where you have a mission operator operating using a mouse to interact with that. 
And on the other hand, you have the enemy dashboard with the enemy having a, a joystick to be able to operate with that. So you have these different capabilities. Uh, and so the entities on the world server are the airstrips, the buildings with attached cameras, the aircraft friendly copters, that's what you have. The sensors at this point that we have are only the cameras right now, so far. The C-130 perimeter defense distributed simulation is really the world server that you see, the perimeter defense computer and the enemy computer. So the world server essentially maintains the state of all the entities in the world and runs a continuous dynamic simulation of all the quadcopters. The enemy computer runs the enemy dashboard which controls the enemy soldiers. And the two dashboard computers communicate with the world server to obtain the entity state, which means X, Y, Z, and theta, to displace all entities on the screen and send the motion commands to move entities that they control. And then the sensors are modeled uh, by the defense dashboard. So these are the capabilities that we have right now. I want to move on and talk to you about the findings to date. The first thing we learned, there is a key problem in, in implementing these kind of hybrid models because you have to resolve the mismatch between the planning and the vehicle control layer. And the way we can resolve this mismatch is you ensure that the propagated commands from the planning layer to the controller do not violate physical and regulatory constraints. Then you propagate the execution constraints from the control layer to the planning and decision-making layer before planning and decision-making function issues the commands. You incorporate heuristics in terms of priorities and regions of influence to resolve conflicts and simplify the computation because you need to continue to do that at every stage to make this problem somewhat tractable. And then you have this notion of adaptive model selection. And the key heuristic here is use the simplest model possible that fits the system function and environment characteristics. So for example, you navigate to the designated area with partial observability, and there you use a PalmDP model. You maintain the flight pattern to assure target area coverage, and there is where you maintain the fitness function. You optimize the fitness function. The Palm DP and the vehicle controller work on different time scales, so that has to be taken into account. The dynamics model runs every 0.01 seconds, and that's for accuracy reasons. The Palm DP runs much slower, because it's a high level decision making uh, and command. The waypoint navigation part of this has the goal of minimizing the response time to action. So the ideal sampling period for the Palm DP is something that we had to determine experimentally. We created the test bed and the prototype simultaneously, and in, in hindsight, that was a really good strategy. It introduced rigor in our experimentation. Currently, we're able to switch between the simulation model and the physical system. In the future, we, need to, we will be incorporating the operational data from the physical system into the simulation model to create, in fact, a bona fide digital twin. And the monitoring and execution dashboard gave us a tremendous byproduct. It was a key capability. Not only did it help with monitoring what was going on in the simulation, but it also facilitated our understanding and debugging of the key vehicle behaviors. So it also became a debugging aid, if you will. So some of the next steps. We're going to be collaborating with our colleagues at AFIT to integrate our respective technologies. And that would be the probabilistic system modeling that would be coming from us and the UAV test environment, which would be coming from AFIT. We're going to expand our modeling and simulation testbed capabilities in terms of having more extensive data collection and also by having the, essentially a bona fide digital twin model. And then finally, the whole notion of distributing computation for sensors and adversary behaviors to bring that into the equation. Some of the key takeaways from the research to date, DOD systems in the 21st century need to be resilient to operate safely in uncertain, partially observable, and oftentimes hostile environments. Adaptive cyber physical human systems, which is an example of a 21st century system, poses unique modeling analysis and distributed autonomy challenges, as you have seen from the talk so far. System model verifiability is key to safety, flexibility is key to resilience, and machine learning is key to adaptation. These are all essential requirements that have to be attended to. Resilience contract, which is what we introduced in this particular research, is a probabilistic model-based construct that satisfies these requirements. 
Modeling today is a closed loop process spanning both the build time and the runtime environment, unlike in yesteryear when it used to be strictly a build time environment. Right now, modeling has to be a closed loop process, especially with the advent of machine learning and such. You need to be able to use data that's coming in from the real world to continue to improve your model. So it has become, has become a closed loop process, and that's what we have here in our solution. And model adaptation implies not only changes in model parameters, but also the modeling construct itself. I call that the principle of proportional complexity. When you can get by with a simple model, you can use a state machine when you need something more complex because you have partial observability, you need something like a partially observable markup decision process. When you have good information and a well-defined structure environment, you can go into an optimal uh, model where you're trying to maximize the fitness function. So all these things can come into play <clears throat> for the same problem in different stages of uh, uh, the scenario. And we have extensible distributed simulations that we are using to implement the adaptive cyber-physical human system with distributed autonomy. Finally, we have shown this approach to work successfully to the perimeter security of a military aircraft. <clears throat> and I think that's, is that the last chart? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, here are some of the general publications uh, that have come out of this research. Uh, they are in the INCOSI Insight, they are in the INCOSI Systems Engineering Journal, and they are in uh, three out of the System Journal of MDPI. And these are all available online. And, and I think uh, that's the end of this talk, and uh, I will take any questions that you may have, but I also want to tell you that the upcoming talk uh, that's going to be given by uh, Dr. Dave Jakes of AFIT is going to be on what does model-based system engineering reference architecture mean for autonomous and cooperative system. I strongly encourage you to attend that talk as well. I, I mean, this is our community and we have to work together to make an advance and I welcome any comments, uh, you know, and, uh, happy to uh, collaborate and, and discuss these points. So uh, thank you, Mimi, and thank you for doing a terrific job as you always do. And uh, and thank you to Barry, and I hope that he's made it to China safely. <laughs> yes, apologies for the conflict, last minute conflict on that one. But again, really appreciate it, and hopefully we'll see you at the next talk and definitely at the CERC Research Review in November. Okay, yes, we shall see you in November. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Bye -bye everyone. Now. Take All care. Right. Bye.